Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for September 19th, 2017. On today's show, we're going to be talking about a bunch of news, including a True Lies TV series reboot. We're going to be talking about the cinema score for Darren Aronofsky's film Mother, the 2017 Emmy Award winners, and The Water Cooler. I'll be talking about Halloween Horror Nights and a secret magic show in Los Angeles. Brad will be talking about a, a stand-up comedy special that he attended. And uh, Ben will be talking about Delta's in-flight movies. Uh, and he has something to say about that. And in our feature presentation, our new writer, Chris Evangelista, is going to be joining us to talk about the films he saw at the Toronto International Film Festival that should be on your radar. I'm Peter Soretta, and with me now are Ben Pearson. Hey, what's up? And Brad Oman. Hey, how's it going? Guys, it's uh, Monday. The weekend just happened. I did a lot of stuff. You guys did a lot of stuff. Um, I'll tell you about my weekend first of all. I uh, I went to the Magic Castle, but we're we're not going to talk more about the Magic Castle. People have heard way too much about the Magic Castle lately. Uh, but I did get to go to Halloween Horror Nights, the opening night of Halloween Horror Nights at Universal Studios uh, in Hollywood, and uh, it's always a great time. For those of you who don't, who don't know, during Halloween time, the month leading up to Halloween or month and a half leading up to Halloween at this point, right? Um, Universal Studios closes down at night and becomes kind of like this other theme park where it's like a haunted haunted mansion, I mean, like haunted uh, mazes, and you get to go on some of the rides after dark, like Jurassic Park. You get to experience that in the dark, and there's like Guns N' Roses, Welcome to the Jungle, blaring, and it's a different experience at night during Halloween Horror Nights. Uh, One of the great things about Halloween Horror Nights is walking through the park. The park has been transformed. There's, like, new lighting, set decoration, fog. You know, you'll turn a corner, and there'll be, like, these crazy clowns with chainsaws coming after you out of, uh, you know, some fog. So you you don't know what where you're ever going to encounter these scares. Um It's always a great time. This year, uh, I want to say that the two best experiences in my mind probably came from uh, they had a maze based on Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, uh, which was really well done. Um, I I don't want to say it was scary, but uh, it perfectly put you inside that movie. You got to walk through scenes and, you know, through that... uh, that famous hotel and you know through the maze at the end and jack is coming at you with with his uh his axe and um it it, it was you you can see some photos on my instagram of they they just did they knocked it out of the park and the other big maze that i liked it didn't seem like a lot of people liked it but uh saw was back with another maze at the at the halloween horror nights and it was another one that wasn't like insanely um scary but every room had like you know someone in like a torture device and it was like very cleverly created and a lot of production value to it so you'd see like you know someone being chopped in half and their bodies moving you know their the underside of their body is moving while their head you know top sides moving so they're using like these kind of like magic illusion kind of tricks to pull off these scenes and um it was it was it was a good time um awesome i've never been yeah you gotta come next year you were on a trip which we'll talk about in a second um the other thing i wanted to to just briefly mention is i saw this magic show in los angeles called see saw and it uh it's kind of like um this thing you gotta kind of hear about and you can buy tickets online too and uh there's just kind of been this trend in magic the last few years of having these small intimate performances and i i want to say like helder and derek delgadio has kind of started this with um uh i forget what their show was called but uh he just did one in in of in in, in of yourself directed by frank oz that was great uh this one is even smaller and more intimate it's literally like 23 people around a table while the magician uh, this guy named Siegfried uh, Tiber um, does magic with cards. Like he he does magic basically for two hours with two decks of cards, a little matchbox car, and a book, and that's all the props he uses. And he you know it's very small, personal, interactive. Everybody gets called upon and is part of the 
the experience and it um, kind of brings you into the mind of a magician. Um, he's very good. He was on Penn and Teller's Fool Us and he actually fooled Penn and Teller. So he's, you know, one of the select few who, who actually fooled them. And as great as Siegfried is uh, with magic, he's just like a great personality. He's like one of those guys that he's instantly your friend. He's charismatic. Uh, he's You're going to enjoy not just watching him perform, but hanging out with him because before and after the show, you get to hang out and, you know, they have alcohol that you can purchase and you can hang out and talk with him. And it's a discussion all throughout the night. You can, you know, ask him questions about, you know, how he does this, how he became it became a magician. It, it's just a great experience. He seeing this magic close up is amazing. And, it, 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 and actually, this place is like literally you have to go to like this building in the back of a parking lot and through a gate and up a set of stairs and it's kind of like one that that kind of trend of um you know bars with hidden entrances and stuff so you kind of kind of have to know about this and it's something i would recommend to anybody that's in los angeles in the next month um i should say my my friend john armstrong uh is the artistic director of the show so that should be disclosed uh but i'm a big fan of magic and i was just blown away by uh the show it, it was incredible there's you know impossibilities happening right in front of your face in in your Very hands cool. yeah so uh so ben you you were on a trip which we cannot talk about because Correct. of uh st- studio embargoes uh where did you go uh i don't even know if i can say that peter to, to be <laughs> honest with you but uh i was in the air let's say um so i i, I traveled by plane Um, and I flew on Delta and this is an airline that I've flown on a bunch of different times before, uh, very recently within the past year or so. And I've noticed something flying on Delta and I want to throw this out there that of course this is like a huge first world problem that means nothing in the grand scheme of things. So don't even come at me with, uh, complaints about me (laughs) complaining about this, but I'm super annoyed with Delta because they edit their in-flight movies for content. And I actually wrote an article about this at SlashFilm.com that you can read all about it there. Uh, but the the basic gist of it is me bitching at Delta because other airlines don't do this. But Delta does for some reason. And I was watching uh, Love Actually with my wife because we were flying together uh recently and she had never seen the movie i'm not really a big fan of that film but i was like okay a plane is a good a good excuse for us to watch this we're basically trapped in a box in the air and it's not like we're devoting time that you know at home that we would be we could be using to watch anything else so let's go ahead and watch this i'll show you this movie and you know sort of see if you agree with me that it's not really that great of a film um so we're watching it and I noticed that one of the characters, one of the subplots in that movie is almost entirely excised from the film. And that's Martin Freeman's character. And uh, what is the actress that he uh, Joanna Page. So Martin Freeman and Joanna Page in Love Actually play movies, play characters who fall in love with each other and they work on a movie set, but like an adult film set. They're like porn actor stand ins, basically. And Delta just basically because there's nudity involved in those scenes, they just took those scenes out of the movie. So that really sort of set me off on this whole thing where, you know, it's one of those things where like we all of us on this podcast, presumably everyone listening to this podcast um, watches a lot of movies all the time. And it's not always easy to remember exactly where or under which circumstances you saw a film. So like a couple years from now, if that was my first viewing of Love Actually, and I got in a conversation somebody with somebody years later, like, oh yeah, remember Martin Freeman in this movie? I would be like, Martin Freeman's not in that movie. What are you talking about? You know, it's like one of those <laughs> things where you're not watching the real movie, and it just uh, angers me. So I wrote this whole thing about it. You can read more about the 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 points and the argument that I sort of lay out there. But uh, but yeah, I just wanted to sort of um, yeah bitch Delta out for editing their movies because again, this is not something that every airline does. I've I've watched. Um, unedited movies on airlines before and they just give a warning at the front of you know when you start the movie like hey uh, parental discretion is advised kind of thing and that seems like it should be enough but for delta apparently it's not and even if that wasn't enough why not like i mean i'm not condoning this but why not show the scene and blur it out or 
or something. Yeah, sure. To... Even that would would be better than. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Not condoning that, but it's better than just c- cutting it out entirely. Well, qu- question: Was this the kind of movie where they're showing it uh, to everybody on the plane? Or you? No. Okay. No. Yeah, yeah. individual <laughs> seat backs. Okay. Yeah. See, I can understand that if it was like the movie that they were showing to everybody and they had to cut sure. out some stuff, but. Even then, just choose not to show that movie. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and then Brad, you went and saw a stand-up comedy special over the weekend. Tell us about it. Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, I went to down to Indianapolis to Butler University to see Mike Birbiglia. He is currently touring with his new stand-up special. Uh, I believe he just started not too long ago, actually. This is one of the earlier stops on the tour. Actually, you should tell people who he is in case they don't I, know. I was just going to, Peter. Um, so Mike Birbiglia is, he's been a comedian for a while now. He has several specials on Netflix. Um, I know what I should have said was nothing is on there. And then he has two Netflix exclusive specials. One's called my girlfriend's boyfriend and thank God for jokes. But he also directed the movie sleepwalk with me, which he stars in and is also based on his life and this real life ailment he has where he sleepwalks and does kind of crazy things like in real life. While he was on tour for uh, for stand up, he threw himself out of a second story hotel window because he was in his dream while he was sleepwalking. He thought he was trying to escape from somewhere, and I guess uh, the glass of the window cut him where he almost cut his uh, femoral artery on his thigh. And if he would have been just like an inch closer, he like he would have died essentially. Um, and so he, he talks about this in his stand-up specials, and it's the, and, the entire... And we, should, we should say Sleepwalk With Me, I think it's on Netflix. If you haven't seen it, uh, you know, get your girlfriend, sit on the couch and watch it. It's a, it's a great great movie. Yes, it is on Netflix. Um, and then he also directed, uh, more recently, the movie Don't Think Twice, uh, which stars Keegan-Michael Key and a, a bunch of uh, other great comedians, uh, Gillian Jacobs, and they play an improv troupe and just how their dynamic works and each of them trying to, you know, become famous for comedy in their own way and just, you know, do what they want to do. And it's, uh, it's very good. They're, they're funny, but they're all, it also has a lot of heart to them as well. Um, so he's, he's absolutely great. And so his new standup special, he's just started touring with it. It's called the new one. And it was just a great performance. Mike Birbiglia has evolved so much as a comedian and a storyteller that he's, he's one of the best comedians out there who, basically performs a one-man show every time he does a stand-up special. There are uh, a lot of comedians, they wander from bit to bit, and there's there's not a lot of connective tissue between them. There's, you know, very very little in the vein of segues, and it's just a lot of it's train of thought, observation kind of stuff. But whenever Mike Birbiglia has done a new special over the past few years, it is always a story. It has a beginning and an ending, and it's like you you feel like you're go, you're living part of his life and ha- as li- like watching his home movies or something. And he's hilarious too. He's he's so funny. And this new one is just, it's about um, how he initially he didn't want to have kids, and you know, and he kind of stood his ground for a while. Then eventually he had a kid, and just all all the trials and tribulations that came with that. Uh, it was such such a good show, and yeah, I, I, I love Mike Birbiglia, and I was not disappointed by by his special. I, I I'm the type of person who loves stand up comedy when it when it is those like one man show storytelling kind of uh, presentations rather than you know joke 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 kind of thing. Um, so I'm gonna have to check out his his latest special. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure when it will be available. So, uh, I'm sure he will be recording it at one of the shows on this tour, but I'm not sure uh, when it'll be out. Yeah. Um, over the weekend, news broke that True Lies uh, is going to get a TV series reboot on Fox. Brad, you wrote it up for the site. Why? I had the exact same question. Um, for years now, everyone has wanted to see True Lies 2, but apparently that will probably never happen for, you know, Multiple reasons. James Cameron's making 20 Avatar sequels and Arnold Schwarzenegger's, <laughs> you know, doing his own thing. Uh, at one time, they did try to get a True Lies TV series off the ground back in 2010 at ABC. It was in development and James Cameron was involved, but it never took off. Now, the idea of a True Lies TV series is back. This time it's in development at Fox. Um, James Cameron is involved again. 
This time it would be a TV series reboot. It wouldn't be a sequel continuing yeah, the story James of the original. Cameron, Jim Cameron's involved because he gets a credit and he like you know signs the check when he cashes it. True. That's that's very true. Um, so he's the executive producer of this TV series, uh, which basically means he's like, okay, go go make this. Uh, the other executive producer that has been announced, and unfortunately, to at least to my dismay, I don't know how everybody else feels about this. But it's Terminator Salvation director Mick G. Yikes. Yep, he's executive producing, and he's also going to direct the pilot. And uh, this is a pilot that we will see because it's uh, being given a put pilot order, which means that the uh, network in question will play the pilot or else it will have to pay a penalty to uh, the producer. So it sounds like we'll see this at some point, no matter, no matter what happens. Uh, it, there is, I guess, some hope in this because it's being scripted by Arrow executive producer Mark Guggenheim, who has done a pretty good job with uh, the DC Comics shows Arrow and DC's Legends of Tomorrow. So there's a chance this could be interesting, but I, I just, I feel like a big part of the appeal of True Lies is Arnold Schwarzenegger in that role. Otherwise, we're just talking about, you know, a suburban couple getting mixed up in spy action, and that's not exactly the most fresh premise uh, it's something that has been seen several times before in many different iterations so i i don't know i feel like i would much rather see a true life sequel even with arnold schwarzenegger at the age he is um than see just them try to make a tv series out of a property just because it's familiar to everybody brad, yeah. brad you're not excited about uh john cena being the the spy in this new tv tv show Let's be clear. John Cena is not in talks or, or anything. <laughs> However, I can easily see him getting getting this role and doing something like that. Yeah. Uh, I, not, not that I want to defend Mick G in any way, <laughs> but um, I should mention that he was the executive producer and director of the pilot for the TV show Chuck, which was very popular. It wasn't something I loved, um, but it just goes to show he can be involved in a TV show people like. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, <laughs> Moving on, let's talk about uh, from something people like to something people hated. Over the weekend, Darren Aronofsky's mother hit uh, the big screen uh, in wide release, and it got an F on the cinema score, which is, it's hard to do. It's very hard to do. Ben, what do we know about this? Yeah, so CinemaScore is an audience polling firm that basically um, collects reactions from people after they walk out of a movie just to see sort of what the – sort of take the temperature of the public at large. Uh, generally, it, it doesn't exactly uh, represent the film's quality, but it's sort of a good um, – yeah, like a thermometer to see sort of how uh, – general audiences are perceiving something um what you know studios use it to sort of decide sometimes about what kinds of movies they should make before you know uh next and also it has a lot to do with like the marketing and stuff was this movie marketed correctly do people feel like they were misled by the marketing so that's sort of the idea of cinema score as a uh, an organization uh so yeah darren aronofsky's mother which is an extremely polarizing movie um I, I have not been able to stop thinking about this film since I saw it on Saturday night. And it is, um, yeah, it's, it's super interesting. I can see definitely why people walk out of it going, what the hell did I just watch? And especially general audiences who may have watched the trailers, they what the trailers don't show is what happens in the third act, which is just a complete, like... And you're not going to spoil go, anything here. No, I won't. But it's just like a go-for-broke filmmaking style where everything collapses and chaos reigns to like the ultimate degree. So it's, it's a, um, a really crazy movie. Um, but it has a lot going for it as far as what it means and, and all of the allegories that you can pick out and all this stuff. But anyway, yeah, the cinema score, it, it received a rare F, which I think only 12 or 13 movies have received uh, an F since they started doing this. Um, some of which are Killing Them Softly, um, The Box from 2009, uh, Wolf Creek, um, Steven Soderbergh's Solaris. So it's sort of like all over the place with the quality and types of movies that get F ratings. Um, 
and again, it has a lot to do with marketing, I think. Um, people were not thrilled with Drive, for example, because that movie was marketed as sort of like a Fast and Furious kind of uh, thrill ride action kind of thing. When you actually see Nicholas Winding Refn's movie, it's very much like a uh, dark meditation with Ryan Gosling. It's very slow and sort of a deliberate kind of movie. So it's not exactly what they were marketing. But um yeah, mother, uh, it's it's getting some pretty insane reactions. Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen this, but Paramount, uh, the studio that released it, actually had to release a statement defending the idea that they would release the movie, which I don't can't remember the last time a major studio put out a statement saying, "Hey, it, we stand by the movie that we just released." Yeah. Definitely so, not on a quality statement. Maybe uh, there there might have been like some kind of controversy, or do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, some kind of like you know, there's rape in the movie movie and they had to come out after the fact or something like that but i don't think i've ever seen it on the fact of like you know this movie's so bad we're gonna have to come out and defend it yeah and and even a lot of the times in the circumstances you were just describing a lot of times it's like the individual filmmaker or like the producers or something of that movie this is the studio itself saying like yes we're fine with this movie the the quote i'll just read it here it says this movie is very audacious and brave you're talking about a director at the top of his game and an actress at the top of her game i should mention that jennifer lawrence stars in the film uh they made a movie that was intended to be bold everyone wants original filmmaking and everyone celebrates netflix when they tell a story no one else wants to tell this is our version we don't want all movies to be safe and it's okay if some people don't like it so i mean i love the sentiment behind that quote um, and it, yeah, it's just sort of insane to me that we've reached this point because this movie is so divisive that the studio that released it had to <laughs> come out and basically defend themselves. But, uh, but yeah, you can read a lot more about mother on the site. We have a really great, um, spoiler review from Josh Spiegel. Uh, we'll link to that in the show notes. And then also Darren Aronofsky basically tells people what the movie is about um and i have a whole article about that that you can read there we'll link to that in the show notes as well and what you mean there is there's some you know uh debate about what the 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 movie means and what happens right so yeah yes he clarifies that and uh that's kind of disappointing because as much as i i probably i have not seen this movie yet i've been too busy going to magic shows and holy and to, to see it but uh i um i want to see it but it's kind of disappointing that the director would come out soon after the film and clarify what it's about because i i kind of like having that discussion in that debate about it yeah and i think the good thing about the movie and maybe the best thing about it actually is that even though aronofsky might tell you what he was intending to do with it there are still so many different ways that you can read this film, uh, even beyond his own interpretation, that I feel like the movie works on so many different levels for so many different people in a, a myriad of ways. So I think uh, even though he came out and basically said, yeah, this is what we're trying to do, I don't think that's going to stifle the conversation around it at all. That's good. So over the weekend, while we were all doing diff- various things, Brad was at home watching the 2017 Emmy Awards, and he reported on it for the site. So, Brad, for everybody that missed it, who who are the big winners? Who are the big losers? Uh, well, it certainly wasn't the audience, I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, no, no, the Emmys were fine. You know, they they are what they are. It's, it's a big, long award show, everybody glad-handing each other, and uh, it was fine. Stephen Colbert was, was a fun host. Uh, he took plenty of jabs at Donald Trump. Sean Spicer showed up, which was both shocking and dumb because, you know, I don't ever need to see him again unless it's Melissa McCarthy, uh, you know, on Saturday Night Live. Um, but, yeah, the the awards themselves, there was plenty of awards that went out to a wide variety of talents. This was a big year for women at the Emmys. This was a big year for uh, people of color at the Emmys and not just in front of the camera as actors and actresses, but also behind the camera as writers and directors. Um, First of all, the the top prizes for series, um, Outstanding Drama went to The Handmaid's Tale, while Outstanding Comedy went to Veep. Personally, that was the major award that I didn't entirely agree with, because I think that while Veep is consistently great and is still very funny, this season is probably the worst that they've had, even though it's still very good, for Veep, it was one of the worst, and it was not nearly as good as the second season of Master of None or the uh, first season of Atlanta. I would have much rather seen 
either of those shows take home outstanding comedy series just simply because Veep has had plenty of time in the spotlight. Julia Louis Dreyfus, you know, won again this year for best actress in a comedy. So I just I would have preferred somebody else get some love. The good news is Donald Glover still won best actor in a comedy for Atlanta, which is awesome. He totally deserved that. Master of None didn't go home empty-handed, though, thankfully. They took home outstanding writing for a comedy series for the Thanksgiving episode, which was co-written by Aziz Ansari and Lena Waithe. And uh, Lena Waithe actually uh, became the first black woman to win uh, an Emmy for writing a comedy series. Uh, She also happens to be part of the LGBTQ community, which is awesome as well. There was also, uh, aside from uh, people of color and women winning big last night uh there was a huge push for like people of all genders too uh, i mean rupaul was on was on the show as as the like personification of emmy uh but there was all this love like thrown at at shows and stars and talents who all are telling these stories about people from you know from the lgbtq community and so there's just this there's a huge you know embracing of these stories and from all different walks of life. And so this, it was a huge diverse year for them. Uh, Big Little Lies was a huge winner. Uh, it took home uh, awards for Laura Dern and Nicole Kidman on the acting side of things. They also won uh, Best Limited Series. So, yeah, there was a lot to go around. Uh, unfortunately, um, what I was disappointed to see, even though plenty of worthy shows still won awards last night, I was kind of bummed that Westworld and Stranger Things didn't win anything throughout the entire ceremony. And I think it's that just goes to show you right now in this current uh, political climate we're in, shows that are more relevant and timely and help us cut through all the garbage that's happening right now and kind of lay things out and present themes and ideas that are poignant and powerful are really finding a lot of success right now. And while there are shows like Westworld and Stranger Things are great, there are these, you know, fantastically written escapes that take us to other worlds and have finely tuned characters uh, and phenomenal, you know, philosophy at at the center of them. They're just not resonating as much with people right now, just because of the way things are going. Um, Stranger Things didn't go home without Emmys completely though, because they did win some creative arts stuff the previous weekend when those were announced, they won best main main title design uh, and best original theme for a main title, uh, which anyone who served. Yeah, exactly. They're 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 killing it when it comes to that. Uh, and Saturday Night Live was a big winner too, um, which was great to see as a fan, somebody who reviews every new episode on Slash Film, whether people like it or not. <laughs> um, Saturday Night Live won Outstanding Variety Sketch Series. Kate McKinnon won Best Supporting Actress in a Comedy, and Alec Baldwin won Best Supporting Actor in a Comedy Series. And he had my favorite line of the night, which was, uh, he said, "Well, I should probably say." Uh, Mr. President, uh, here's your Emmy at long last. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's good. Uh, okay, guys, before we go into our future presentation, I got to say goodbye to you, both of you. Uh, ben, we can find more of your work, slashfilm.com, at Ben Piers on Twitter. Brad, you can always find at Ethan underscore Anderton on Twitter, slashfilm.com, and his podcast, Go Flix Yourself on iTunes. And for our feature presentation, I have a new Slash Film writer, Chris Evangelista, to come on and talk about the best films he saw at the Toronto International Film Festival this year. Chris, how's it going? Good. How are you? Good. Uh, are you still recovering from the, the film festival? I think I'm just over it now, finally. It took like a, a week when I got there. <laughs> so you saw almost a dozen films at right. Toronto. Is this your first time in Toronto or have you or... This is my second year. I went last year too. Second time. Um what what do readers need to look out for? Like what what are what do people need to be excited for? Uh well, Guillermo del Toro's The Shape of Water is a great movie that I really hope people see because people didn't go see his last movie, which was uh, Crimson Peak. And um uh, it's it's just I think this is probably his best film. It's 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 gorgeous to look at. It's what is, what, is, what is this movie about? This is about it's set during the Cold War and it's about a uh, a mute woman who works as a, a custodian at this secret government testing ground. I guess it is testing lab, and they bring in what's this, which is essentially a uh, it's like the creature from the Black Lagoon. Basically, it's a, a amphibious man. 
and it sh- and the the woman and the the fish man fall in love and it, that sounds kind of out there but it, it's played completely straight like it's never like made fun of it, it just presented as something completely natural and that's what sort of makes the film so endearing to watch i mean it sounds like the most guillermo del toro film that you could possibly have at the toronto international film festival it definitely is yeah um wh- how, how does that rank uh in the filmography of del toro have you had any time to think about that like i i really think this might be his best movie honestly i think it's it's him taking everything he's he's basically learned and done as a filmmaker up to this point and employing it to uh, perfection. Like he 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 has like a complete control over the story here. There's nothing there's no there's no fat on the story, I guess you could say. It's all it's like a, a very well thought out, well made movie and it's probably his best, I would say. Um a film I saw at Sundance a couple years ago was this film called Tangerine by this guy named Sean Baker. He yes. filmed it on an iPhone. I was shocked. It was it was an original vision. It was uh, now he is back with a you know he has a budget this time around. He has some yes. uh, name actors and it's the Florida Project, which I'm a big fan of uh, Disneyland and yes. uh, Disney World, and that's something. Uh, that's what they called Disney World, which Walt Disney called Disney World the Florida Project. So tell me about the Florida Project because I'm interested to hear uh, about it. Florida Project is probably my favorite movie uh, I saw at the fest. It, it's it's uh, it, it blew me away. It, I mean, like you said, Sean Baker he made Tangerine, which is a great movie. This is even better, and uh, I mean, it does have a budget, like you said, but it's not it's not like him making like a big blockbuster. It's still very much a very <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying he's not shooting this thing with iPhones this time. No, around. no, it's it's it, it's gorgeous to look at too. There's all these. It, there's a lot of scenes is set at sunset, and you know, the, it has that like that Florida sky feel to it, or just like that reddish pink hue to it. And uh, Disney actually does play a, a big part in the story. I don't want to say too much because it's kind of a a twist sort of, so I don't want to give it away, but okay. you can, you always feel the presence of, of Disney looming over the film because it's set in this sort of rundown motel right outside of Disney. So it's always like, Disney's always like lurking in the background sort of, but it's a, it's a really emotional movie. It's, it's not really big on plot. It's more episodic, which sometimes can be bad, but it, here it works really well. And uh, Willem Dafoe is in it, and he's so good in this. This is probably my favorite performances of his that I've ever seen. It's just, it's a great performance. Uh, what else did you like at Toronto this year? Um, I really liked uh, Call Me By Your Name, which is a, a very, it's, it's just a great movie. It's basically, uh, it's about, it's set in the 80s in Italy, and it's about this young man, and his father is an uh, archaeologist. And his father gets an assistant who comes to live with them at their villa over the summer, uh, played by uh, Army Hammer. And they basically fought the young man and Army Hammer's character basically just, just fall in love over the summer. And it's a very like lush sort of film. It just it feels like summer. It's a very summery movie. And uh, it's very well acted. It's gorgeously directed. It's, it's, that's, that was great. Um, another film I really liked that took me by surprise was... Uh, Professor Marson and the Wonder Women, which is about the man who created Wonder Woman and the uh, certainly for them, the certainly for that time, which is, you know, the the 50s or. But by the way, it's so perfect that this movie got made when it did, because people might actually watch it. Yeah, I, I really hope they do, because otherwise, I don't know if this would be that big and I hope it that, you know, because Wonder Woman came out this year, it gives it that push. Cause it's a, I thought it was going to be, you know, this very standard sort of biopic, but it's not, it's, it's funny. It's charming. It, it really took me by surprise. Uh, and Rebecca Hall is phenomenal in it. I think she's one of our most underrated actresses working right now. She was in like, the town and the prestige and I feel like she's one of those actresses. Most people don't actually know her name, but she's always great in everything, and she's particularly good in this. Yeah, she's amazing. That movie comes out in theaters October thirteenth, I believe. So yes. uh, you'll see that soon. Uh, what What else uh, did you? Uh, what about the uh, the death of Stalin? That was great. That was hilarious. That's uh, obviously from the guy who made Veep and In the Loop. 
and it, it's it's set you know, right after Stalin has died, basically, and it creates this power vacuum in Soviet Russia, and everyone's scrambling to basically fill fill his place. And I knew it was going to be funny because it's from you know the guy I made in the loop, but it's also it was a lot darker than I thought it was going to be because you know it's obviously I should have assumed that because it's set you know during a very dark time, but it's a lot more violent and disturbing than I was expecting, but it makes it into this sort of very uh, darkly comedic movie. And so that, that, that was a, a nice surprise. It's a very interesting film. I don't know if, I don't know if everyone's going to like it because it's, it's much darker than it's being sold as. And, and there was a couple of films that you were disappointed in. Uh, I know you weren't loving George Clooney's, um, Suburbicon. No, I, I was excited for that. I wanted to see it. I was looking forward to it. It has a great pedigree. It's got a great cast. The Coen brothers co-wrote the script. So I, w- I went into it expecting to love it. And it's just a very flat, lifeless movie. It's like two movies jammed together and neither of, on their own. The, either film might have worked, but together they don't work well at all. So and I, I normally like George Clooney's directorial efforts i really liked uh good night and good luck i thought it was a, uh, an excellent film but he just doesn't have i don't know i don't want to say skill but he doesn't have the right eye for this sort of film and it just doesn't work yeah i i, I like this uh debut which was that uh biopic of who was it? Charlie Cox. Oh, um, Chuck Barris. Yeah, Chuck Barris. It, it, I loved how stylistic that was. Um, that was great. Yeah. 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 I, 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 she would do something like that again, but apparently not. Yeah. Um, another movie I was looking forward to, I was disappointed to hear is not good, is Alfonso uh, Gomez Rijon's uh, The Current War. He's the guy that did um, Me, Earl, and The Dying Girl, which I loved. Uh, I know it's a very divisive film in the film film world. Uh, what did you think of this film, The Current War, which also should be said, you know, uh, Tesla, Edison, the war going on there. Just a fantastic topic for a movie. I mean, I did not dislike it as pretty much pretty much everyone else I talked to at TIFF hated it with, a, with like a passion. I think it's fine. It's not a great movie, but it's not, you know, like the worst thing you're ever going to see. It's it's entertaining. It's, it's really well directed. It's got a lot of style to it, which I, I've heard some people say it has too much style. Like it's overly stylistic, but I, I kind of like the style. The performances are, are good. I mean, Michael Shannon, who is pretty much always great. He's very good playing uh George Westinghouse, he actually gets to play a nice character for once. He usually plays, you know, creeps and weirdos, but in this, he's pretty much the nicest guy in the movie, and it's fun to watch him play someone nice for a change. Uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, he's not doing anything new here. He's he's once again playing a very smart person who's also a jerk, which seems to be pretty much the only role he, he likes to play, and he does it well. I mean, you know, he's he's very good at playing that role, but anyone wishing he would stretch himself a bit, they're not going to get that here. Yeah. And I, you have this whole article on slash film.com giving awards to the best performances, best movies, best scenes. Uh, I would recommend everybody go to slash film.com and read it. It'll, I'll link it in the show notes. And there's obviously links in that to all your, the reviews that you wrote for the site while you were at TIFF. Um, is, is there any, uh, any last thoughts about this year's 2017 Toronto film, international film festival? that you'd like to leave us with? Uh, I mean, it's it's a it's a great fest overall. I wasn't as impressed this year as I was the first year, but that could just be the first year I went. I was so new to it. Everything seemed amazing. Whereas this year, I, I, I don't, I don't want to say I'm jaded already because it's only been a year, <laughs> but uh, I wasn't as overly impressed with the films that I would have liked to be. The, the performances were great. Pretty much across the board, every film I saw had a great performance in it. Just the films themselves what, were as great. What were some of the films you saw last year that were like the the great films of 2016? Uh, I saw Manchester by the Sea last year. That was like the first film I saw. It was, I saw it 8 a.m. on the first day. And oh, wow. It, it completely blew me away. I was like, oh, my God, is this what the whole festival is going to be <laughs> like? So, I mean, that sort of set like a precedent for that year, whereas this year uh, it just wasn't – I mean, I don't want to say they were bad because they were they're good movies, especially compared to – a lot of the junk that gets pushed out every every month, but I just I was hoping for just a little bit more wow factor than I got. Sure, 
I, yeah. I, 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 I just think generally, like looking at the the list of films that played last year, you know, La La Land, uh, Manchester, it's it just a higher pedigree. And it seems right. like this year's. Um, you didn't get to see the the new Morgan Spurlock film, did you? No, I did not have a chance. No, I'm, I'm interested in that. Uh, I, I, I strangely like his films, even though they're uh, not no. w- not well reviewed, but. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Uh, for sure anyways um you can read this whole thing on slash film.com uh chris where can we find more of your work online uh i am i'm pretty much anywhere someone will publish me i've got, I've got stuff uh cut for film i've got roger ebert.com i have something coming soon from nerdist just you know look yeah. for me somewhere on the internet and drop me a line yeah. and tell me you actually read what i wrote <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you can find chris's work now daily on slashfilm.com yes. he's he's covering the news beat and uh and uh hopefully uh bringing his signature uh style and wit to that yes um, I hope so. you, you you can find more of my work at slashfilm.com uh you can find this podcast on itunes overcast stitcher all, all the popular podcast apps subscribe uh follow us you know give us a review on itunes rate us that helps us out quite a bit and we will see you tomorrow